Uh, so this is Zabina. I have joined from another instrument. So we'll start soon in a minute. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. We'll start in a minute, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sabina teacher, can I uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Baba sir, I can hear you. Hello. We'll start in a minute, sir. Yes, sir. Baba sir, I can hear you. Sir, you are audible. Okay, sir, okay. Yes, sir. We'll come back uh, within one minute, sir. We'll start in in a minute. James, sir, hope you are there. Hope James, sir, have yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll start now. Teacher, hello. Hello. Hello, Vivek Matai, sir. Yes, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm Dr. Babu. Yes, I was talking to you. Oh, a former student of Dharmati. Uh, Yes, to Andrew, on the topic, some revelation of insecurities and vulnerabilities. 
once again a very good morning to one and all now a uh, welcome all of you to 134th dr john matai memorial lecture and national webinar organized by by department of economics university of calicut we all have been going through a very tough time in the face of covid and today's national webinar is on the topic impact of covid-19 on the transforming indian economy first let us start with a prayer for that i call upon gayatri and surabhi for the prayer song So let's get started. I would invite our head of the department, Dr. Zabina Hamid, ma'am, for welcome and presidential address. A warm good morning to one and all. Most respected controller of examinations, Dr. C. C. Babu Sir, University of Calicut. Our guest of honor, Professor K. S. James, International Institute of Population Studies, Mumbai. Sri Vivek Matai, grandson of Dr. John Matai, consultant, food, dairy, and beverages, Mumbai. other family members of dr john matai professor k v ramachandran sir professor k x joseph sir dr shibu s kotaram other colleagues teachers from various institutions within and outside kerala other dignitaries who have joined online and offline office bearers phd and mphil scholars and my beloved students we have assembled via online to commemorate the 134th birthday of dr john matai the great legend first of all with love and honor i express a hearty welcome to dr cc babu sir controller of examinations university of calicut for being with us to inaugurate the function sir is well known to most of us as and is an alumni of our department Sir is a person with busy schedule, organizing thousands of examinations in the largest university of Kerala. Without any hesitation, Sir readily agreed to inaugurate the function, and we are blessed to have you here to grace the occasion. Once again, I welcome you, Sir, to this event. Our honourable Vice Chancellor consented for the inauguration, but due to unavoidable health reasons, he could not join us. so dr babu sir have joined with us thank you sir for joining us uh, and uh, we request you to 
uh, deliver the inaugural address after the presidential address. With respect and pride, I welcome Professor Case James Sir to this function. Sir is a renowned economist within and outside the country. He is at the limelight in any discussion on populated, population related research. He has a very rich and linked biodata, which is a highly inspiring one. Our faculty will introduce Sir to our participants soon. On behalf of the Department of Economics, University of Calicut, Dr. John Matai Center, we extend to you a hearty welcome. Welcome, Sir. We are extremely happy to see that family members of Dr. John Matai have joined with us. Sri Vivek Matai, grandson of Dr. John Matai, Mrs. Silo Matai, daughter-in-law of Dr. John Matai, that is Vivek's, Vivek Matai's mother, sister Radha, brothers Nitya and Ashok, and wife of Vivek Matai, Kuma Matai, all have joined with us for this event. Sir has been contacting me very frequently and many times these days and have sent us many photos and even videos about Dr. John Matai and that will be disseminated to all the participants and we will be presenting it today uh, for the audience. Few more members of Dr. John Matai have also joined us. Sri Vivek Matai will be sharing with us his memories about his grandfather, Dr. John Matai. On behalf of the academic fraternity of Department of Economics, University of Calicut, I extend a warm welcome to all the family members of Dr. John Matai. Eminent resource persons like Professor U.S. Mishra, Center for Development Studies, Professor Bino Paul from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Professor Mani K.P., Dr. Chako Jos, and Dr. Terry Simon have also consulted, uh, consented to deliver lectures and also to chair the sessions. I welcome uh, our resource persons to this function. Now I extend a hearty welcome <coughs> To all, the, uh, to all my colleagues, Professor K. V. Ramachandran, sir, Dr. K. X. Joseph, sir, Dr. Shibu Eskotaram, Dr. Rajula Helen, Dr. Deepa Vidi, uh, Ms. Prinsha, Mrs. Priya, Ms. Arthana, I welcome you all to this function. We have many participants from outside Kerala. Many have joined online and offline. I welcome all the dignitaries and teachers who have joined us. I also welcome our section officer, Sri Mansha Dwee and his team to this event. Last but most important, I wholeheartedly welcome all our PhD and MPhil scholars and MA and MA financial economic students to this event. Now, now I would like to mention that due to slight changes in the program schedule, I am also interested to deliver the presidential address. So I'll give a brief narration of Dr. John Matai and about the event. Charlie John Matai was born on 10th January 1886 in an Orthodox Syrian Christian family in Korikot. He graduated with a degree in economics from the Madras Christian College in 1906. In 1908, he joined the Madras Law College and completed his Bachelor of Law in 1910. He later pursued his doctoral research at the London School of Economics and Political Science and uh, as well as a billet from Oxford. Matai was one of the main architects of Bombay Plan, which was hailed by the then Viceroy of India, Lord Wavell, as a solution to India's economic problems. Dr. John Matai held many key offices in New Delhi during the time of transition from pre to post independent India. He was the finance minister twice in 1946 and in 1948 to 50, and in between held the portfolios of industry and supply and railway and transport. Post independence, he served as India's first railway minister and as the second finance minister of independent India. His ex-Tumba budget speech is well acclaimed. 
he presided two budgets between 1949 to 51, and then he resigned following the protest regarding the vesting of huge powers in the hands of planning commission, which is still a debate. He said to be called Honest Matai by Nehru. Dr. Matai has been an academic in Madras, an administrator with the central government, and an economist with Bombay with the Tata Group. He was in the world of high finance, and his wide expertise and diverse experience brought him a range of opportunities in, the, in those transition times, including the chairman of Taxation Inquiry Committee and the first chairman of State Bank of India. His appointments were unusual, his administrative challenges were unfavorable, and his exit from the government was also unexpected. He served as Vice Chancellor of University of Mumbai from 1955 till 1957, and then as the first Vice Chancellor of University of Kerala from 1957 to 1959. Considering his contributions, Dr. John Mathai was awarded the Patma Vibhushan in 1959. It would be injustice if I fail to uh, mention few words about Achama Mathai, wife of Dr. John Mathai. She was a lady of great charm and intelligence and graced several positions in the public. In recognition of her many contributions to the country, she was conferred with Patma Shri in 1955. Dr. John Mathai Centre Trishur, located on the large plot of land spanning 18 acres, is don donated to the University of Calicut, and this move was initiated by Achama Mathai and the family members of Dr. John Mathai and this center is named after Dr. John Matai as Dr. John Matai Center. And anyone can log into the website www.drjohnmatai.com for further details about the family. Now, very brief about the webinar. On every January 10th or on the next working days, we organize Dr. John Matai Memorial Lectures. It used to be one with festivity color and celebration every year. But because of this COVID-19 pandemic, we have planned it online. We very well know that COVID-19 have crippled economies across the globe. The agony and complexity created by the pandemic are unprecedented and the threat has delved deeper into all spheres of life, bringing the socioeconomic life to a standstill. Apart from the threat, the economic and social dis disruption threatens the very existence of life. GDP has staggered and plunged, uh, reflecting more or less total suspension of economic activity. Barring agriculture, all other major indicators of growth in the economy are massively impacted. The economy is like a bird whose feathers are lost. We are even, we are unable to enjoy the fruits of the so-called demographic dividend. To be on wheels, we are experimenting with co-vaccine, COVID shield, and are observing dry runs. Our greatest primary task is to pay attention. I'm not prolonging my words. With these words, I conclude my presidential address. And once again, I welcome each one of you to the program. And I hope and pray that the event will be an academic treat for the researchers and students. And I wish you all fruitful sessions ahead. I also request our students to keep the vision and spirit of Dr. John Matai ahead in their pursuit of knowledge and carry forward his dreams along with ours. Also, let me mention that Sri Vivek Matai has uh, informed me to request the university to do the needful in releasing a postal card in the name of Dr. John Matai. Once again, hearty welcome to one and all uh, to, the, to this academic event. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your warm welcome. Next, I would invite our beloved controller, Dr. C. C. Babu, sir, Associate Professor of University of Calicut, to deliver the inaugural address. Hey, good morning, all of you. Uh, all of you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes. Uh, good morning, all of you. Okay, let me start. Hello? Yes, sir, you are audible. 
okay thank you uh, respected uh, chair of the session uh, dr sabina hamid hamid madam and the uh, distinguished guest uh, dr uh, james sir uh, the family members especially uh, vivek mathai his wife and family members of dr john mathai uh, my dear uh, colleagues especially uh, uh, dr k v ramendra sir uh, k x joseph sir k t mani sir uh, shibu s kataram um, chakra jo sir and uh, simon uh, my dear students research scholars and teachers and faculty members from other colleges and neighboring states it's a very great uh, privilege and honor in my life to inaugurate a very illustrious function in the name of a great uh, man and uh, a great man in the name of a great institution uh, with all privilege uh, and honor i take this opportunity to inaugurate this illustrious function with all my respect and honor uh, thank you all see university of calicut is considering uh, is a very unique and uh, respectable institution uh, your dr john mathai center uh, the university is considering it's a very uh, in par with the main the institutions or the departments which lies or uh, operating in the main campus by trying to impart all type of uh, amenities which are available in the main campus to all students the uh, studying at john mathai center both in uh, scholastic and non scholastic domains of uh, knowledge and always consider john mathai center even though it is far away from our main campus it consider as a unique institution or a unique department which delivers and which provides a daily uh, unique services to the main campus see as you know uh, when we are uh, pursuing or pursuing in the track of uh, getting higher uh, uh, stars or higher uh, uh, levels of uh, in the attainment of uh, nac accreditation the institution john mathai center and its uh, other allied institution is uh, providing higher ranks to our uh, main campus uh, strictly on uh, specific courses uh, uh, run by that institution so uh, in the name for in uh, for our university i i have the sure and the full courage to say that uh, john mathai center is a, a very unique department uh, in the uh, calicut university is uh, concerned and uh, is a uh, main campus or the, 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 the statutory offices are always uh, in the forefront for uh, providing all amenities all uh, facilities to the students and uh, academic and non academic uh, issues uh, facing the department is concerned see uh, uh, ലോകത്ത് ആകമാനം വളരെ പ്രതിസന്ധി നിറഞ്ഞ ഒരു കാലഘട്ടത്തിലൂടെ കുറച്ച് കഴിഞ്ഞ ഒരു വർഷമായി ലോകമെമ്പാടും പ്രതിസന്ധിയിലൂടെ കടന്നു പോകുന്നതാണ് നമുക്ക് കാണാൻ കഴിയുന്നത് ലോക ഈവൻ ലോകത്തെ വികസിത രാജ്യങ്ങളൊക്കെ തന്നെയും കോവിഡ് പാൻഡമിക്കിന് പ്രതിരോധം ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്നതിനോ മരുന്ന് കണ്ടുപിടിക്കുന്നതിനോ അതിനോട് പ്രതിരോധിച്ച് നിർത്തുന്നതിനോ പരാജയപ്പെട്ടു പോവുകയോ ആശങ്കപ്പെട്ടു പോവുകയോ ഒരു കാലത്തിലൂടെ കടന്നു പോയതാണ് നമുക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും അറിയാം വി ആർ ഫാമിലിയർ വിത്ത് ദി എക്സ്പീരിയൻസ് ഫേസ് ബൈ ദി വേൾഡ് ഗ്ലോബൽ ഇക്കോണമീസ് ഓൾ ഇക്കോണമീസ് ആർ ദേ ആർ ഗ്രോപ്പിംഗ് ഇൻ ദ ഡാർക്ക്നെസ് ദേ ആർ ഓൾവേസ് റിയലി ഗ്രോപ്പിംഗ് ദ ഡാർക്ക്നെസ് ഹൗ ടു കൺട്രോൾ ആൻഡ് റെസിസ്റ്റ് ദി കോവിഡ് പാൻഡമിക് വിത്തൌട്ട് എനി ആൻഡ് ദി ഡോട്ട് അതുകൊണ്ട് മറുമരുന്ന് പെട്ടെന്ന് ഇല്ലാത്ത ഒരു സാഹചര്യത്തിൽ ഇതിനെ എങ്ങനെ പ്രതിരോധിച്ചു നിർത്താം എന്നുള്ളതായിരുന്നു ലോക രാജ്യങ്ങളുടെ എല്ലാവരുടെയും ഒരു ശ്രദ്ധ ഊന്നിയത് എങ്ങനെ പ്രതിരോധം ആ പ്രതിരോധത്തിന്റെ ഒരു കാതൽ ഫോക്കൽ പോയിന്റ് പോയിന്റ് ഓഫ് റിസിസ്റ്റിംഗ് ദിസ് അത് വ്യക്തിയിലെ അധിഷ്ഠിതമാണ് വ്യക്തി കേന്ദ്രീകൃതമായി വ്യക്തികളിലേക്ക് ചുരുങ്ങുന്നുണ്ട് എങ്ങനെ നമുക്ക് ഇതിനെ പ്രതിരോധിക്കാം എന്നുള്ളതാണ് ലോകത്ത് മുഴുവൻ രാജ്യങ്ങൾ ലോക രാജ്യങ്ങൾ വികസിത രാജ്യങ്ങളൊക്കെ ആണെങ്കിൽ പോലും അവർക്ക് ഇതിനോട് പ്രതിരോധിക്കുന്നതിനോ പ്രതിഷേധിക്കുന്നതിനോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ പ്രതിരോധിച്ച് നിർത്തുന്നതിനോ കഴിയാത്ത സാഹചര്യത്തിൽ ഇന്ത്യയിലും വിഭിന്നമായിരുന്നില്ല ഇന്ത്യ മഹാരാജ്യത്തും കോടിക്കണക്കിന് ആളുകൾക്ക് പ്രതിരോധം ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്നതിനോ മരുന്ന് കണ്ടുപിടിക്കാനോ ഒക്കെ അതൊക്കെ സ്വാഭാവികമായി കഴിയാത്തൊരു സാഹചര്യത്തിലൂടെ നാം കടന്നു പോകുന്ന ഈ ഒരു ദശാസന്ധി എന്തുകൊണ്ടാണ് ആ സമയത്തുകൊണ്ടാണ് നാം 
ഇപ്രകാരം ഒരു കോവിഡ് പോസ്റ്റ് കോവിഡ് ഇക്കോണമിയെ സമ്പദ് വ്യവസ്ഥയെ എങ്ങനെ നമുക്ക് മുന്നോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുവരാൻ കഴിയും എന്ന തരത്തിലുള്ള ചർച്ചകൾക്ക് നേതൃത്വപരമായ പങ്ക് വഹിക്കാനായിട്ട് ജോൺ മത്തായി സെന്ററിന് കഴിയുന്നുണ്ട് എന്നുള്ളത് വളരെ ചാരിറ്റിയാണ് all the, the, the teachers and the, the, the uh, health department for organizing such a wonderful seminar in a highly contributing value to era kerala tinde sahajrathilekku variyanengil keralavum vibhinamaya oru sahajrathilude ella nam kadannu povunnu ee marunna kandupidikkan kariyatha arengil elupa marunna illatha oru sahajrathil engine ee rogathe pradhirodhikkan kariyum ennulla pravartanangalana keralavum kerala tinde ഈ കോവിഡ് പ്രതിരോധ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങൾക്ക് അതിൻ്റെ സ്വാഭാവികമായ അവസ്ഥ പോലെ തന്നെ ഒരു ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് സംതിങ് വിച്ച് വാസ് ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് ഫ്രം അവർ ഓദർ സ്റ്റേറ്റ്സ് എല്ലാ രാജ്യങ്ങൾക്കും എല്ലാ സംസ്ഥാനങ്ങൾക്കും വ്യത്യസ്തമായ രീതിയിൽ നിന്നുകൊണ്ട് പ്രതിരോധ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങളെ കേരളീയ സമൂഹത്തിൽ മുന്നോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുപോകാനായിട്ട് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ടുണ്ട് എന്നുള്ളത് ഒരു ഓരോ കേരളീയനും അഭിമാനിക്കാവുന്ന നേട്ടമാണ് ഇതിൽ നിന്നെല്ലാം വ്യത്യസ്തമായി എല്ലാ ഇതര സംസ്ഥാനങ്ങളിൽ നിന്നും വിഭിന്നമായി വൈവിധ്യത്തോടുകൂടി നമുക്ക് പ്രതിരോധ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങളെ കൊണ്ടുപോകാനായിട്ട് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ടുള്ളത് എന്നുള്ളത് കേരളീയ ജീവിതത്തിന്റെ ഒരു വൈജാതിത്വത്തെ പോലെ തന്നെ വ്യതിരക്തതയെ പോലെ തന്നെ നിലനിർത്തണം ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ഓൾസോ വി ആർ ഫോളോയിങ് ഡിഫറെന്റ് വേ ടു റെസിസ്റ്റ് ദ മെഷേഴ്സ് വി ആർ അഡാപ്റ്റഡ് ഫോർ റെസിസ്റ്റിംഗ് ദി കോവിഡ് ഇറ്റ് സംതിങ് വിച്ച് ഈസ് ഡിഫറെന്റ് ഫ്രം ഓൾ അതർ സ്റ്റേറ്റ്സ് ഈവൺ ഇൻ ദി ഇൻ അവർ കൺട്രി ഓർ കമ്പയറബിൾ ടു അതർ states of the world we are following a specific features in the resistance program adile nammal keralathinte nokku valare anugaraniyamayittulla valare madhurgaparamayittulla mattulla idangalil ninnu vyathyasthamayittulla reethiyil ittara pravartanangale keralaya samoothine kondu vaanayittu kazhinjittundu ennalladhu valare abhimanagaramayittulla oru nee onnu naam oomiyadhu enikku thonnathu oomiyadhu വളരെ ദീർഘദൂരമായിട്ടുള്ള പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങളോടൊപ്പം തന്നെ ആളുകളുടെ ആശങ്ക എങ്ങനെ കുറച്ചു കൊണ്ടുവന്ന് പ്രതിരോധത്തിന്റെ മുൻമല മുൻപന്തിയിൽ വ്യക്തിയെ സ്ഥാപിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് എങ്ങനെ പ്രതിരോധ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങളെ മുന്നോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുപോകാൻ കഴിയും എന്നതിനെ കുറിച്ചും സാമൂഹ്യ സുരക്ഷാ മേഖലയിൽ എത്ര എത്തരത്തിൽ ഒരു സർക്കാരിന് ഒരു ഭരണകൂടത്തിന് ഇടപെടാൻ കഴിയും എന്നതിനെ കുറിച്ചുള്ള വ്യത്യസ്തങ്ങളായിട്ടുള്ള മാതൃകകൾ അവതരിപ്പിക്കുന്നതിന് കേരളത്തിന് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ടുണ്ട് കാപ്പാസിറ്റി ടു uh introduce uh, different programs uh, not only in the resistance program but in the uh, but in in fourth fund we are we was all we were always in the fourth fund for uh, formulating uh, programs in the domains of socio economic uh, measures to uh, to uplift or to uh, stabilize the standard of living of the people by uh, adopting uh, some uh, socio economic measures hello oru vaadu udaharanangal namukku kandathirunnu onnu otta udaharan mathrame ഞാൻ സൂചിപ്പിച്ചു ഒന്ന് കേരളം നടപ്പിലാക്കിയിട്ടുള്ള ബ്രേക്ക് ദ ചെയിൻ പ്രോഗ്രാം യു ജസ്റ്റ് ലുക്കിംഗ് ടു ദി ഫിലോസഫി പൊളിറ്റിക്കൽ ഫിലോസഫി ഓഫ് ദി ബ്രേക്കിംഗ് ടു ദ ചെയിൻ പ്രോഗ്രാം അതിന്റെ ഒരു മനഃശാസ്ത്രം അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അതിന്റെ തത്വശാസ്ത്രം അതിന്റെ ഫിലോസഫി മാത്രം പരിശോധിച്ചാൽ മതി ബ്രേക്ക് ദ ചെയിൻ പ്രോഗ്രാമിന്റെ ഫിലോസഫി എന്തായിരുന്നു അതിന്റെ എനിക്ക് തോന്നിയിട്ടുള്ളത് ആ ഫിലോസഫിയിൽ നാം എപ്പോഴും ഊന്നുന്നത് നമ്മെ കുറിച്ചിട്ടുള്ള ആശങ്കകളല്ല നമുക്ക് അപ്പുറത്ത് നിൽക്കുന്ന മറ്റൊരു ജീവി ഒരു വ്യക്തിയെ കുറിച്ചിട്ടുള്ള ആശങ്കകളാണ് നമ്മൾ പ്രധാനത്തിൽ കേരളീയ പൊതുമനസ്സിന്റെ ഒരു തലം അതാണ് നാം നമ്മെ കുറിച്ചല്ല ചിന്തിക്കുന്നത് നമുക്ക് അപ്പുറത്ത് ജീവിക്കുന്ന മറ്റൊരാളുടെ ജീവിത മണ്ഡലത്തെ കുറിച്ചിട്ടാണ് കേരളീയർ എപ്പോഴും ചിന്തിക്കുന്നത് അതുകൊണ്ട് കേരളീയ പൊതുമനസ്സിന് അത് കോമൺ സൈക്ക് ഓഫ് കേരള ഹീസ് ഹൈലി പൊളിറ്റിസൈസ്ഡ് ദർ ഇസ് എൻഡോമെന്റ് ഓഫ് ഹൈലി പൊളിറ്റിസൈസ്ഡ് കോമൺ സൈക്ക് ഓഫ് കേരള കേരളത്തിന്റെ പൊതു ചിന്താ മണ്ഡലത്തെ വളരെ ഒരു പൊളിറ്റിസൈസ് ചെയ്തിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു പൊളിറ്റിസൈസ് ചെയ്യാ എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞത് അവനവനെ കുറിച്ചല്ല നാം ഏറെ ചിന്തിക്കുന്നത് അപ്പുറത്ത് ജീവിച്ചിരിക്കുന്നവനാണ് ഇത് തന്നെയാണ് നമുക്ക് കോവിഡിന്റെ കാലത്ത് പ്രതിരോധ പ്രവർത്തനത്തിന്റെ ബ്രേക്ക് ദ ചെയ്യുന്ന ഒരു ഫിലോസഫി നാം നാം മുഖം മറച്ചു വയ്ക്കുന്നത് കൈ കഴുകുന്നത് സോഷ്യൽ ഡിസ്റ്റൻസിങ് സൂക്ഷിക്കുന്നത് രോഗം എനിക്ക് വരുന്നതിനപ്പുറം എന്നിൽ നിന്ന് മറ്റൊരാൾക്ക് വരരുത് എന്നുള്ള കൺസേൺ കൊണ്ടാണ് ഇതാണ് കേരളത്തിന്റെ പ്രതിരോധ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങളെ 
വ്യതിരക്തമാക്കുന്നു നാം നമുക്ക് രോഗം വരുന്നതിനപ്പുറം നമ്മിൽ നിന്നും മറ്റൊരാൾക്ക് രോഗം പകരരുത് അതുകൊണ്ട് ഏറ്റവും കരുതലോടുകൂടി ഈ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങളെ മുന്നോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുപോകേണ്ടതാണെന്ന് ഓരോരുത്തരും ഏറ്റെടുക്കാനായിട്ട് കഴിയുന്ന തരത്തിലേക്കുള്ള ചിന്താമണ്ഡലത്തിലേക്ക് കേരളീയർ മാറിയിട്ടുണ്ട് ആ മാറ്റമാണ് അങ്ങനെ കേരളത്തെ നമ്മിൽ നിന്നും അടർത്തി മാറ്റി അപ്പുറത്ത് ജീവിക്കുന്ന ഒരു മനുഷ്യനെ അപ്പുറത്ത് ജീവിക്കുന്ന മനുഷ്യ സമൂഹത്തിന്റെ കരുതലോടുകൂടി ജീവിക്കാൻ കഴിയുന്ന വലിയ വിശാലമായ ഒരു പൊളിറ്റിക്കൽ തലത്തിലേക്ക് നമ്മുടെ ചിന്താമണ്ഡലത്തെ മാറ്റിയെടുക്കണം ആ മണ്ഡലത്തിൽ നിന്നുകൊണ്ടാണ് നാം വ്യത്യസ്തങ്ങളായിട്ടുള്ള വ്യതിരക്തങ്ങളായിട്ടുള്ള പദ്ധതികൾ പോളിസീസുകൾ നടപ്പിലാക്കുന്നത് എന്ന് നമുക്ക് മനസ്സിലാക്കാം അതോടൊപ്പം തന്നെ ആദ്യമായിട്ട് മനുഷ്യന്റെ ഒരു സാധാരണ അതിസാധാരണ മനുഷ്യരുടെ ജീവന് സുരക്ഷ നൽകുന്നതിന് ആവശ്യമായ സാമൂഹ്യ സുരക്ഷാ പദ്ധതികളുടെ ഒരു വലിയ ഒരു ശൃംഖല തന്നെ തുടങ്ങിയിരിക്കുന്നു അത് ഇപ്പോഴും അനുസ്യൂതം തുടർന്നുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്ന തരത്തിലുള്ള വ്യത്യസ്ത പ്രോഗ്രാം അതിനൊന്നും നമ്മൾ എണ്ണമിറ്റ പരിപാടികളൊന്നും അക്കമിട്ട് പറയേണ്ടതില്ല വ്യത്യസ്തങ്ങളായിട്ടുള്ള സാമൂഹ്യ സുരക്ഷാ പദ്ധതികളൊക്കെയും തുടർന്നു കൊണ്ടുപോകുന്നതിന് കേരളീയ സമൂഹത്തെ പ്രേരിപ്പിക്കുന്നത് വളരെ ജൈവപരമായി ജീവിക്കുന്ന മറ്റുള്ളവരെ കുറിച്ച് കരുതലോടുകൂടി ജീവിക്കുന്ന ഒരു ജൈവ സമൂഹം കേരളത്തിൽ നിലനിൽക്കുന്നത് കൊണ്ടാണ് അത്തരം ഒരു സാമൂഹ്യ മണ്ഡലത്തിൽ നിന്നുകൊണ്ടാണ് നാം ഈ പുതിയ കാലഘട്ടത്തെ ഈ കോവിഡ് അനന്തര സാമൂഹ്യ വ്യവസ്ഥയെ നാം കണ്ട് നോക്കിക്കാണുന്നത് എന്ന് നമുക്ക് പരിശോധിക്കേണ്ടതുണ്ട് അതുകൊണ്ട് ജോൺ മത്തായി സെന്റർ ഏറ്റെടുക്കുന്ന ഇത്തരം പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങൾ ഏതൊരു പ്രവർത്തനത്തെയും ഈ മണ്ഡലത്തിൽ നിന്നുകൊണ്ട് നോക്കി കണ്ടുകൊണ്ട് നമുക്ക് പുത്തൻ രീതിശാസ്ത്രങ്ങളും അവലംബിക്കുന്നതിനും പുതിയ ചർച്ചകൾക്കൊക്കെ തിരി കൊടുക്കേണ്ടത് തുടങ്ങേണ്ടത് ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെന്റുകൾ തന്നെയാണ് അക്കാദമിക് ഷുഡ് ബി എ സം ടൈപ്പ് ഓഫ് ഗീവ് ആൻഡ് ടേക്ക് പോളിസി ഓഫ് ദി അക്കാഡമിക് കമ്മ്യൂണിറ്റി ടു ദ നോൺ അക്കാഡമിക് കമ്മ്യൂണിറ്റി സോ ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ദ നോർമൽ ഐ തിങ്ക് ഇറ്റ്സ് എ ഡ്യൂട്ടി ഓഫ് ദി അക്കാഡമിക് സൊസൈറ്റി ഓർ ദ കമ്മ്യൂണിറ്റി ടു ഓർഗനൈസ് സച്ച് എ വണ്ടർഫുൾ ആൻഡ് അക്കാഡമിക് പ്രോഗ്രാം ഫോർ ഗിവിംഗ് ഓർ ട്രാൻസ്മിറ്റിംഗ് അവർ academic ideas to the non academic societies for uh, uh, implementing and launching different policies so it is the normal duty of our department and the department is organizing in a, or taking that responsibility in such a manner to benefit the society i once again congratulate all the teachers and uh, the department heads of department all uh, uh, research college and i think the research colleges are the real uh, fruit bearers and fruit uh, uh, fruits winners of this program we should have uh, to observe all these things what have how what is there, what are the things happening in the platform and uh, assimilate your knowledge and in, in this and kindness your uh, knowledge and uh, uh, i once again congratulate these scholars and uh, other students uh, who are assembling and the, the faculty members and the distinguished guests from uh, the, in the name of uh, university of calicut once again congratulate and uh, i once again i take this opportunity to say announce this program is uh, uh, inaugurated thank you thank you thank you very much thank you sir thank you for uh, delivering the inaugural address next i invite dr deepa vidi faculty of department of economics to introduce the resource person Good morning all. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce and welcome the resource person, Professor Dr. K. S. James, Director and Senior Professor, International Institute for Population Sciences, IAPS, Mumbai. He is a profound scholar in formal demography, population and development, mortality, health and aging. He was awarded postdoctoral degree from Harvard Center for Population and Development, Harvard University, USA, and PhD in Demography from JNU, New Delhi. He is working as Director and Senior Professor in the National Institute for Population Sciences, Mumbai, since 2018. He was the Professor in Population Center for the Study of Regional Development, JNU, New Delhi, and was also the Acting Director, Institute for Social and Economic Change, Bangalore. He is the visiting fellow in Population Research Center, University of Groningen, then Netherlands, and the Center for Research on Aging, University of Southampton, UK. He has published more than 80 articles in various national and international journals and edited books. He has a 
part of more than 50 seminars and conferences both inside and outside India. He has delivered more than 114 talks and paper presentations including various seminars, conferences and workshops. He was also involved in various major research studies, the latest of which include National Family Health Survey, Global Youth Tobacco Survey and Gender Equity and Health with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. He has handled nearly 16 major research projects and has held many training programs. So it is with special excitement and pleased to welcome you, sir, for presenting the topic on pandemic in the era of demographic change implication for India. On behalf of the Department of Economics, I delighted to welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a very generous introduction and good morning to all of you. Uh, respected C.C. Babu, Control of Examination, University of Calicut, Dr. Sabina Hamid, the head of the Department of Department of Economics, the John Mathai Center, University of Calicut, uh, the family members of Professor John Mathai, Sri Vivek Mathai is also visible for me. I'm sure all others are also around. Um, Professor K.B. Ramachandran, Department of Economics, and Professor K.X. Joseph, and Sri Srijit Ramanan, and distinguished participants, my dear students, and good morning once again, good morning to all of you. And it's a really, a, indeed, a great honor, and I'm really humbled to deliver a memorial lecture in honor of one of India's, we can say, distinguished economist and policy thinker, as well as those who build institutions and institutions in this country. Um, I know I don't need to really tell all of you this is Dr. John Mathai's contribution to the Indian economy, to the Indian society in general. I think being a first railway minister, subsequent finance minister, and being in several prestigious, occupying prestigious positions, both in universities as well as across other institutions. He has built several excellent institutions in this country, which paved for way for the, the later economic development in this country especially NCAER, and all other institutions are vivid examples of his immense contributions that Dr. John Mathai has made for this country. I think we have to remember his fondness, his real contribution to the country, as well as not only in terms of his academic caliber, in terms of his scholarship, that is only one part of it. I think I also understand that his family, and also he himself was really a extremely good human being. I think that's a vivid example of the John Mathai Center, the family donating so much of land to building institutions in this country. I think we all remember with fondness Dr. John Mathai, as well as his immense contribution of his family for building this country to and building institutions in this country to this level. So thank you for inviting me for providing this memorial lecture. I am humbled and I thank you, uh, Dr. Sabina Hamid for the generous in invitation as well as the introduction. May I also take this opportunity to congratulate the Calicut University Department of Economics actually having a thought about a conference and a importantly, a particularly important theme Today, I think the impact of COVID on the lives of the people or the economy of this country. I think this is an appropriate moment to have such a conference, such a meeting, and such a discussion because the country needs more such discussion and emanating the ideas from, especially from the young generation of this country. And I'm particularly happy that a large number of students are really attending this conference as well as this memorial lecture. Let me talk a bit 
on what I would be taking talking today. Although I would have liked, you know, because I have been introduced also as an economist, a distinguished economist of this country, but I hardly work on economics aspects in this country. So primarily a demographer, so I primarily concentrate on the issues on demography and perhaps its linkages with the development. So that is where I thought it is important to really see what would be the impact of this current demographic changes in the context of a COVID. So if we have to talk about that, I also need to talk about what is that we would have expected from a current demographic changes. What would have been the expectation on the economic front? What would have been the expectation at the social front? What would have been the expectation at the behavioral front? If we have some expectation, can a pandemic like COVID-19 can have an impact on such expectation? I think that is what I would be looking at uh, maybe in the next 30 minutes of my lecture. So let me also share my slides. Just give me a second. I hope it is visible to all of you. No, I, I know all of you are aware that the, the history of population growth, if you look at all over the world, has always been history of pandemics and epidemics. So, uh, I'm sorry, is it visible to all of you? I, I hope it is visible, so I'm just proceeding. So if you really look at the thousands and thousands of years in this world, I think always the population has remained very, very, population growth remained very, very low, primarily because of the pandemics and the epidemics. So that's why if you really look at up to 1800 or so, the population has never grown substantially in this, in this world. So naturally, the birth rate was always been high. The death rate was always, was also always been high. So naturally, you had a situation where the population remained almost, you can say, at the very, very minimal level, and it is it has not grown anything substantially. So which is actually, I think all of you, especially the students, we study that the essays on the principles of population, the Malthus has written. He has actually written eight edition of his book, the same book, which is first published in 1798, and then he has, uh, sorry, seven editions. And they, each of the editions, he has tried to put a lot of, lot of empirical examples on how actually, whether the, the uh, pandemics, whether the epidemics, whether it is the, um, the you can say, the, uh, or the scarcity of food, all those things really affected the human population growth. That was what, and there his books was all about. So naturally there has been a lot of interest in it at that time. So this is what, just to show that, you know, if you really look at from the beginning of the Christ era, Christian era, because from the AD, if you really look at up to sort of 1800, it was only 1 billion, the population has only just reached 1 billion. Thereafter, the changes has been faster. The changes has been faster because of two reasons. All of you know, the mortality has de declined, primarily indicating that we were able to control the epidemics and pandemics. That was the major landmark, and which has resulted in a rapid population growth period. But thereafter, the birth rate also has come down in many parts of the country, so many parts of the world. So naturally, you would also see a declining growth rate later part of the, you can say, 20th century or even early part of the 21st century. So that is sort of a scenario we know about the population growth. Let me also come back to India because I would be more concentrating on India today. So India's population growth as well as its impact on the development. So if you really look at India's demography today, everyone speaks more of an in optimistic sense rather than maybe a couple of decades back where there, are, there has been a large pessimism on the rapid population growth in this country. Maybe not in Kerala, because Kerala had, all of you know, had a relatively early demographic changes. But otherwise, in many parts of the country, there has been a real concern of population growth. It 
almost, you can say, the complete second half of the last century. The fertility transition now stands at a very, very, you can say, optimistic level of 2.2 children. Uh, it means that, you know, you should normally be considered 2.1 as replacement level, which, which indicates that the, the birth rate and death rate is becoming sort of or equal or in the, in the long run, not immediately. But I think almost you can say you are reaching replacement level. We also know that the mortality, which has been a major concern in this country, has come down drastically and life expectancy has improved also tremendously. And the infant mortality rate now stands at something around 32, which is also slightly higher, but you can say nothing much higher what we would have expected a couple of decades back. It was in the 60s and 70s. Now it has come down. It is coming down faster as well. So most states in this country are now below replacement level. So that is where you can say even more than half of the country states in this country has reached a fertility level, which is a desirable fertility level, according to the government, because the government wants to achieve a replacement level fertility, which has been reached. And as I told you, the demographic patterns are now viewed more optimistically in this country than anything pessimistic. So, but at this time, we are also experiencing a pandemic. Because as I told you, when the pandemic was experienced in the past, it was always been when there has been a large fertility rate, so large birth rate. So there was parents or the society expect a large number of mortality, a more children dying was almost expected or it was a norm in that society. And suddenly any pandemic or any mortality, high mortality, etc., never created much of a problem in the society. Although that the population growth rate remained, you can sometimes it was negative, sometimes, sometimes it was positive. And this is not the situation now. Fortunately, COVID-19 doesn't have much of that kind of a mortality effect because the mortality effect of COVID-19 has been very, very minimal compared to many other pandemic. But in a pandemic, is not something which has been completely eradicated in this world. That is what actually the COVID-19 bring to the uh, table of, for all of us. So there can be later even a much worse pandemic with uh, perhaps a much higher mortality uh, probability. So in that case, how would it will affect the expected positive impact of demographic changes? That is what I would be talking today. As I told you, if you really want to know what is the expected positive impact on demographic changes? We would also should know what is the expected demographic positive impact of demographic changes in the economy or in the society. So we will, I will come back to that a little bit more later. But this is what we would perhaps expect in terms of implications of demographic change. I think all of you are aware, and all of you, all of us hear this word several times now that the economic impact of demographic changes, that is the demographic dividend. So I'm saying this is commonly talked now, whether it is in the, uh, the media, whether it is in the newspapers, whether it is in the general public even started talking the word demographic dividend. So naturally, will it a pandemic will have an impact on the demographic dividend? If so, in which aspects of demographic dividend? And there is also large other changes which is expected in the demographic, uh, with the demographic changes, there is a social change, there is a behavioral change, there's a health, which are also not seldom emphasized, but it is, there are large literature on that, how actually demographic changes can really impact your entire life. So, which is also, I would not touch upon much about it, but I would just perhaps tell you one or two points on the social and behavioral changes, because that's very, very important in a society, especially in a situation of pandemic. So I would perhaps bring a certain elements of the social and behavioral changes. And finally, the critical question is that whether demographic changes have a positive impact, because that is also not certain. If so, what would be that positive impact? So. As I told you, the focus of my talk, because there are a large number of students also today attending this, I would perhaps explain a bit more details on the demographic changes in this country and what is its implications in terms of demographic dividend? What does it mean for a country like India? And 
also a little bit of talk on other aspects of the demographic changes and in the impact. And then we will finally tell you what is actually a pandemic can really affect or benefit because of demographic changes. That is would be my emphasis of today's talk. So let me come to the first part of it, which is on the India's demographic transition. I don't think I will spend much time on this aspect because it is much talked about and most of you are aware of it, especially those who live in Kerala are very much aware what is really happening into the case of Kerala, what kind of demographic changes has happened in this state and also what is actually evolving after the demographic changes because the in, the, in that society, more of the aging population, its impact, all these are really talked about. But, you know, we should also, perhaps it's important to understand that, you know, one of the major social, you can say even some people consider it as a social revolution, which has happened in this world, especially in the second part of the last century, the 20th century, has been the demographic changes, which has a tremendous impact, which on various aspects of our life, whether it is economic life, whether it's social life, whether it's a behavioral life, all those aspects, and it's a health, and undoubtedly there is a very large impact. Although we have really much understood its various dimensions. I think, you know, this is just to show you what is really happening, where actually our birth rate and death rate coming closer. I don't think I need to spend much time on that. So this is what I was telling you that the demographic changes of late is considered are much more in an optimistic manner rather than in a pessimistic manner. So if you re really look at the latest data which are available, the majority of the states in India has reached something called a fertility level or the birth rate, which is which is which we measure as the number of children uh, born to a, uh, a woman in this country. It is something called less than 2.2 because we expect that two is the replacement level because two parents replacing two children in this world. That is why two is considered as the, the critical minimum uh, which one should have or a country should achieve. And you would also see many states in this country as much even below less than two. So if you even look at a short of span of between last 10 years, you would also see a very drastic decline in the fertility in all parts of the country and in all states in this country. Whether it is in a very high fertility situation like Bihar or Uttar Pradesh, where it was, if 10 years back it was above four, but it has come down to almost three now. And it's also the case with these other states, which has been very low in the past, like the, uh, you can say Tamil Nadu or Kerala or Karnataka, etc. But, you know, it's also continuous to low. It is not, again, declining much faster, but it is remaining low. So. It also one way, you know, there are two principles of demographic transition. One principle, let's say, there is something called the irreversibility of demographic changes. That means that when the fertility declines or the birth rate declines, it's impossible or it's, it's, there's no evidence so far from any countries of the world that it can reverse back. So it, you will get a high kinds of birth rate or high fertility in the future. So there is an irreversibility of the demographic changes which is very, very important because you mean to say that, you know, you would never see a society, whether, you know, there's large number of young children or the smaller children, but you will only see a society now in the future with large proportion of older people, because there is no evidence still, still to suggest that there can be a complete reversibility of the demographic change. So although there can be small variations from 1.7 to 2 point or something etc is possible, but not really from 2 to 3 or 3 to 4, those kinds of changes are never recorded anywhere. So that is the situation. This is on the infant mortality rate, which I have told you, there is it's also very optimistic in the sense that there has been a large decline in many parts of the states, country, and many states in this country. And especially for the last 10 years, there has been a sharp decline in because of several policies as well as uh, other uh, program implementation by government uh, of India. And you can also see the 
if you look at the population pyramid where we we will come back to this little more carefully when we speak about the demographic dividend all because of all these changes we would also see now less and less people are born at younger ages and you have a situation where large number of people of the population is in the working ages that is what we typically call as a demographic dividend so the age pyramid is the appropriate way of depicting a demographic dividend which exactly we will know so if you really look at in this pyramid the five to nine age group population will be higher than the zero to four population that clearly means that less and less children are born in this country compared to the past and because of that you would have you would experience a negative growth rate in the younger age group if you look at even 2011 census in india the zero to four population or five to nine population was a negative growth it basically means that in that population there are less people are born compared to the previous decade so this is a case which is really happening in this country so you can actually see this pyramid will grow and there is also large concern when the pyramid grows when majority of this adult population moves to old age what will happen there is another economic concern which many people have raised although i won't speak much about it today's lecture i would also just touch upon to tell that what would be the likely impact of a, such a transition so before coming to talk about the implications of demographic changes it is also important to really understand how the demographic changes happened in india i think that distinguishes actually india from other countries of the world and that also has an impact on how we will have an implications of demographic changes so if you really look at what is expected what in the, what was a conventional understanding of how actually demographic changes took place all over the world except maybe perhaps some of the developing countries like india or some of the other african countries now and also some asian countries so we know that you know one of the best way to depict that was the demographic transition theory which actually brought out or depicted the demographic changes should be preceded by a socio-economic changes so when we actually the birth rate when will the rates decline it should decline only when there is a improvement in the living standards of the people because with the living standards your mortality will decline and with the living standard when it was the poverty levels declines whether the economic standard goes up naturally you would also see a change or decline in your birth rate that is what typically it is depicted by different transition theories so and another important factor especially in the case of kerala or other places it has been also found that among the socio-economic factors perhaps female education is the critical important indicator which can really say okay if we provide females education and empower the females through different means that will have a direct impact on the demographic changes so can say okay a reduction in mortality is mandatory that is is depicted by different transition process because unless you have ensured that your children are ready, able to survive you will also will not stop uh, having children at one or two because you are not very sure about their survival but when you are very sure about their survival uh, like now you know because most of the children we know that they will be surviving so if that's the case it's, it's also there is also a motivation for the parents to reduce their number of births and so conventional wisdom tells you that actually overall the development is sort of a mandatory condition for a demographic changes that is what we have learned or we have studied but what did happen in india i will give you two slides and give you an examples on that so if you really look at in india if this is a graph which depicts the total fertility rate among illiterate women in this country so what does it really signifies now it indicates that actually the demographic transition or the transition in the birth rate in this country but not necessarily by a very improvement in the literacy rate or the female education in many parts of this country the decline in the birth rate happened irrespective of an improvement in the social uh, indicator like female literacy rate 
or even economic indicator like a substantial improvement in the living standards of the people. Because mostly, actually, the poor sections of the population, the literate sections of the population, has also major share in the demographic changes in this country. So if you really look at many, you know, you can uh, don't look at Kerala, etc., because it's an exception because there is no illiterate in this Kerala. That is why you, you will get this weird result. But otherwise, you would see many countries, many states in this country, actually, the, even in the illiterate fertility rate has been relatively very, very low, low even less than two in many parts of this uh, states. Wherever the illiterate fertility has been higher, where actually even general fertility is higher, that is because not because of the illiterate there, but it is on account of the general environment in that states or in that region of this country. So that is what actually the conventional wisdom perhaps doesn't really go directly or cannot really apply directly to the fertility transition or the demographic transition in this country. The same picture you would also get even if you look at the relationship between infant mortality rate and the fertility rate. You would also see a zigzag kind of a graph here, which is which really indicates that even when the infant mortality rate was relatively high, there are states which really experience very rapid reduction in fertility. And the classic example nowadays telling the east, east uh, part of the country, especially Orissa. Which is, the, which is now called as Odisha. So where actually the fertility rate has come down drastically, but at the same time, the infant mortality rate is almost as high as Bihar or the Uttar Pradesh or anything. So, which means that actually the conventional wisdom of the female literacy rate, female education, the a, a drastic decline in the child survival, the necessary conditions for the demographic changes or the birth rate transition, perhaps may not be that much true in India. So what does it really indicate? I think that is what the message is that, you know, if in a country, in a state, because when we speak about the implications of demographic changes, we also speak about implications primarily because we, on, we know that the demographic changes are also preceded by certain changes, certain socioeconomic changes, certain improvement in the education level of the women and overall population, an improvement in the living standard of the people, improvement in the economic uh, front. All those we would have anticipated. That is what which has happened in large majority of these countries in this world. But in India, when we speak about demographic changes, <clears throat> when we also see that that is not true. A large majority of the people who has, who has really gone for a smaller family in this country are poor, illiterate and they are actually in the working age groups. So we, when we see a bulge in the working age group, we could also understand that we have a different characteristics of the working age group in this country, which people really have concerns because of that characteristics of that group, because the demographic transition process, the fertility transition process, everything was slightly different in this country. So. We, could, we should also expect a different implications of demographic changes in this country, not like what we would have expected in a typical Western country, so with typical other countries of the world, where demographic changes has a demographic dividend, whether there is another changes, etc. Perhaps may not exactly true in this country, but there are possibilities to make it happen. So that is what uh, we would expect. So let me now talk about the implications of demographic changes, and then we will come back to uh, what would pandemic can really lead to uh, in such kind of a scenario. <clears throat> so, as I told you, I, I don't think that I need to describe too much on this uh, part because uh, what is the demographic dividend? I think I've already indicated to you because for the students' benefit, I will perhaps just tell you a few sentences. It really tells that as the birth rate started declining, your age structure also changing, but age structure changing is only a demographic process, but why it is leading to a demographic dividend? Because we also expect that each age group of the population behaves differently with the distinct economic consequences. So when you are in younger population, you behave differently because when you are young, young, definitely you need to get support because 
you cannot survive unless someone is supporting, whether your parents or someone has to transfer money to you. When you are perhaps old, in that time also you, someone has to transfer. But when you are adult, when you are working, you are not only able to support yourself, but you can also support many other people. That is why actually there is generation accounting, which we say in economics, which is also true in the case of demographic dividend. So this is why demographic dividend occurs, because you have a different distinct age group of population has a different proportions of the population. So with changing the relative size of these groups, relative intensity of the economic, the economic behavior also changes. That is what we see. So the size matters always. The size is more in the working age group. That is why if you look at a household, what happens? Within a household, you may have two parents working, but you have only one or two children to uh, support. But earlier, you have a household of five, you have two parents working, but so the dependency ratio, all everything keeps changing. So that is why a bulk, a bulge in the working age group creates a different demographic waves, it seems. So <clears throat> we are also told that actually the swing in the age structure depends on how rapidly the fertility and mortality changes. That is why the rapidity of the demographic changes, because it is also understood that the age structure changes or so the demographic dividend stage is a transitory stage. It will not be there for a long period. It will be there only for a shorter period. And the period is determined by the fastness of the demographic changes. You have a rapid decline in fertility and mortality. You'll have a shorter period because it will go faster. That period will go faster and then you will have an elderly population. But in the case of Western countries, it was a very slow transition over a period of almost a century. The demographic changes took perhaps between 1800 to 1900 or even up to 1920. You can say though, that is why in those places, we would also see the demographic dividend also stayed for a longer period. But in India, you can you cannot say very fast, but you can say moderate or slightly moderate and faster, you can say. So the period perhaps will not be that long, but maybe will be definitely there for 30 to 50 years. So that is why they say there is something called a window of opportunities. So window of opportunities, those period where a large majority of your population will be in the working age group and there is less people in the old age population. So that is the stages which we say first is the high fertility and high mortality whether you have a very young population age dependent young dependency ratio is very very high and then the transition happens fertility declines you have bulk of people in the working age group which is called a window of opportunity period and then you have something called a third stage of the transition which is and old age dependency increases which now it is depicted as something called a second demographic dividend because there has been a large concern whether that period when the old age dependency increases, can it be uh, detrimental to the economic growth? But of late, there has been large number of research and studies on this. It has been found that there is also an opportunity for many countries, which is in terms of having a second demographic dividend. So many countries of the world, the neither the economic growth nor the living standard has not declined substantially because of the increase in the old age dependency ratio. But it's also accompanied by several policy measures. It's also accompanied by several other characteristics, which I will not touch upon this lecture. So let us look at the economic implications in terms of demographic dividend. You know, there has been large concerns in this country, whether actually India can really reap the demographic dividend or how far actually India will be able to uh, sustain the demographic dividend, or whether we will be able to take the opportunity of demographic advantage in this country. I think there are a large number of pessimists in this. If you really look at, I don't know, who those are following the media, those are following the, the newspapers. I think most often we found that the entire literature is on the, uh, the theme that India's pessimism of demographic dividend and India's possibility of achieving the demographic dividend is possibly the grim. That is the message which is provided by 
you can say many of the the large writings you can say but if you really look at the entire world i think there has been large number of positive evidences on that whether it is in this several countries of the world even with some studies in india has been giving sort of a very positive impact on the demographic dividend but you would not see in a general uh, stock or even general understanding the demographic dividend really occurs because if, if you really look at the popular writing perceptions on demographic dividend in india has been very very pessimistic i think there are a large number of literature on that we don't need to go about that i think we also need to understand why this has been pessimistic i think primarily because of the two reasons we can say one is that it has been always been argued that the the bulk of the people in the working age group in, in the country are unskilled illiterate and they will not be able to contribute much to the economic growth that has been a major concern because you know after the human capital theory comes into the prominence after the 1950s it is that it has been generally considered that the human capital is one of the important the growth engine of this many countries of the world and in that case if we have a peculiar demographic transition where actually transition occurred with majority of the people illiterate and unskilled people coming into the workforce will it have an impact on the demographic dividend that is what the one of the concerns which has been raised the second perhaps the concern is that you know there not only there there is also what is called a general we can say lack of employment opportunities in this country so when lack of employment opportunities persist when educated unemployment is also quite substantially high in many parts of this country what does a demographic dividend indicate what does a bulk of the people in the working age group indicate for this country i think this has been perhaps the two major concerns many have raised because of all these two reasons they say okay you may not be able to achieve the demographic dividend in this country i think but you know it's I, i'm not going to get into this methodology part of it but then i think it's important to talk something about that because the reason being how do you really estimate it how do you really understand that whether a demographic changes will have a positive impact or negative impact on the economic growth or the improvement in the living standards of the people i think ultimately i think the the whole purpose of the demographic changes why actually the government actively promoted demographic changes or the transition in the fertility rate or promoted the small family now all with the expectation that it will have very positive impact not only for the country but even at the household level at the uh, the individual level so the living standards of the people will go up when you have a smaller families than larger families if that is the case why actually there can be a, there should be a concern at all irrespective of whether we illiterate irrespective of all other bad part which we have accumulated because of the the peculiar nature of the transition but even despite that all these fact one would expect that it should have a positive impact so let me just give you some examples of it one is that you know there seems to be there is some disconnect between what is actually the popular writing and what is actually the very empirical estimates now if you really look at the very uh, good studies which has been published in many uh, reputed journals which is with a very thorough empirical uh, uh, statistical methods you would see that you know all these studies irrespectively telling that the demographic dividend in india will be very very positive perhaps the last study which is called the ir and modi which is the imf study which which actually brought out substantially what would be the positive impact of the demographic changes in this country but i told you the pessimist always criticized it i think i know i have already given the pessimist the part of the story i think this is the perhaps the one you know the large number of writing on the other hand which is in whether it is in the media whether it is in the uh, newspapers whether it is in other popular uh, journals also there has been large number of writings that it will be negative 
So how do you now understand it? I, I think in that case, you really need to get a little more deeper into it and to see what is actually the demographic dividend is all about. I think that is what I would be doing, perhaps. I think there is demographic dividend can occur in this country. What is the ways, if it is primarily a dividend is a primarily a transition process, a structure movement, that a structure is primarily because of a decline in the birth rate, the structure transition happens. And if that's the case, what way actually the demographic changes can affect economy? They say actually there are accounting factors you can forget, but there is some behavioral factors. That is where it is. One of the important factors they say, okay, there is there can be an increase in the women's work participation resulting from my fertility decline. That is what we would expect because earlier it was, you know, in many economies, if you look at the men invariably work, whereas unemployment rate among the men will be slightly lower, much lower, but unemployment rate among the women will be much higher, primarily because I think not, not only in terms of unemployment, but even the work participation rate, because they are not able to concentrate uh, spend much of their time for the workforce because the past when they had high birth rate naturally much of their time was going for childbearing and child rearing so naturally the transition has a positive impact on them and secondly people say okay you can have a proportion of household saving will be much higher because when you have large number of children you would save much less than when you have a smaller number of children within a family so household saving and when you have an expectation of life expectancy it, our life is also very high. So naturally, your saving rate also will go up substantially. And there are also other ways, reallocation of resources from investing in children to receive capital, etc. may be there, but the possibilities are very, very limited. But let us look at these two factors. I think that's very, very important. If demographic dividend has to happen in a country, we would expect that there should be a high saving rate, household saving rate, and also we should expect that a high female labor force participation. This is the two pathways through which really a demographic dividend can occur. That is how, these are the two important pathways if you look at East Asian economies, if you look at many of the European countries, where how actually demographic changes benefited these countries was primarily because of these two pathways. So what does it happen? If you really look at the domestic savings, obviously in India, I'm saying, and compared to many countries of the world, uh, this Indian saving rate has always been higher. There is no doubt about it. But if you look again last 10 years, it has been slightly constant or you can say declining. It's not increasing. Even in the face of a de drastic demographic transition occur occurring, a drastic fertility transition has been occurring. But even then, you would not see, you didn't see a very drastic improvement or increase in the saving rate. People say, okay, domestic saving rate are also a function of many other factors. It can be because of all these reasons. But one has to really understand that that has not happened. What's the case with female labor force participation? I think that has been much worse. I think it has been much talked about. So you would see that between last 10 years or even, even before 10 years, even from 1999, uh, 2000 onwards or something, which we have data, and the latest, latest PLFS data, which is from the NSSO, which also tells actually female labor force participation has been declining substantially from almost last two decades or even three decades in this country. So even in both these front, you have seen that actually there is not expected improvement in, in India, even despite fact that there is a demographic changes. What does it really indicate? It, it perhaps indicates that actually the, the benefits or the dividend which you would have expected from a demographic changes, that is primarily in terms of the saving rate improvement or in terms of the improvement in the work participation of the females, both has not really happened in this country. So if that's the case, I think the popular writings that, you know, the demographic dividend in India has not been positive or demographic nightmare is occurring in this country or India's demographic dividend is more of a demographic burden 
these are the statements which has been coming up can perhaps be substantiated by some of these statements some of this data but i think you know <clears throat> people also has looked at why such things have has happened you know some of the argument was that because there is a u-shaped uh, curve it's kind of a relationship between female labor force participation and economic growth so when the initial periods of the economic growth female can withdraw from the labor market because of they have been working in agriculture they move out of that and then move but there has been you no know, consensus on that there has been disagreement on that so and there is also argument that you know the decline was not real because decline was primarily because the females started now going to the education especially for higher education so naturally you would not you would see that 15 to 19 or 9 so 15 to 29 age group women who were earlier was not participating because they were out of school and also getting married at early marriage but now that is not the case they are really studying now because they will later get into employment perhaps partly it is true we can we will we have seen that work participation of females at the younger age group has declined so but it also others argue that no it cannot be the substantial reason for it and there are also reasons that because it is, it is also a structural problem in the indian economy because there's jobless growth in this country not only for the females but for the males so all these things can really happen because of various reasons so if these two are the critical important variables of the demographic changes we would see how this is going to work out or spin out in the years to come especially in an era of pandemic now that is has been one of the major concern in this country if you really understand because saving rate i think it's very easy to understand because saving rate definitely unlikely to go up especially in a period when there is a very drastic decline in the economic growth rate and especially when the distress levels are going up because of the my the retired migrants and also lack of job opportunities etc um <clears throat> definite that it, the saving rate perhaps will again further decline and whether it is reverse back to the older 37 percent or 38 percent at least to 40 percent because in china etc it's much more than 40 percent so that's what india would like to achieve to that level of saving rate but it is very very unlikely that that might happen so the next possibility is that can it be possible to increase the female labor force participation in this country especially in an era of pandemic so what's the evidence we can look at actually the evidence of 1921 when 21 in the sense the influenza period that was the earliest pandemic which we know the last pandemic which we know that is in 1718 the influenza or spanish flu which we is commonly known as the mortality has been much higher in that but if you look at the 1921 census we also see a temporary increase in the female labor force participation especially in the service sector soon after that but whether that can happen this time we really don't know but if you look at again 1931 census this has again reversed so the benefits soon after the pandemic which the, an increase in the female labor force participation although not in the saving rate that much but which has been there for some time but we know that later part because we don't have the intermittent surveys like now like an sso at that time really to understand what would have been between 21 and 31 we know we get all these data only from census and the census shows that it has improved but again it has declined in 31 but 31 also you can you will also know that by that time great depression has started so naturally there could have been a decline because of the depression impact as well but there has been an increase how does this increase has come about with Undoubtedly, it was also preceded by certain policy changes. I, I'm saying government was very concerned with it. And there has been, as all of you know, the mortality has been quite substantially high. The mortality, many often a pandemic mortality affects male much more than females because male is much more, more exposed to outside world. They go for work and because of all these reasons. So naturally, it was also perhaps there are some people argue that it is maybe also a distress driven increase in the work participation of the females because the 
ordaining member of the household perhaps would have perished, that let the female to go out and uh, end their living, the daily living. So it's also possible that it is it is because it was preceded by policies. Government also adopted policies, and that policies did some benefits for the the uh, improvement in the female labor force participation. So it means that actually it is possible. It, the, the past evidences show that it is really possible because you know the pandemic etc gives you a different type of opportunities. Whether actually the uh, deliberate policies to help the female sector to come into workforce through these policies can perhaps increase the female labor force participation in this country undoubtedly. And let me, because uh, since I have taken some 40, 45 minutes, I, I would not, I think, want to delay any further on this. So perhaps I will take another a few minutes to really tell you, because I also, in the initially I told you that I will also speak as something on the the social and behavioral changes, which is very, very important, I thought. Because why it is important, I think the pandemics also changes your outlook towards a society. I think I was listening to uh, the control of examinations talk, CC Babus. I think this is perhaps Kerala has been an exception to this because Kerala, the, the and their method of addressing the pandemic then there are ways the society even joined together to address a problem has been exceptional. But what does it really pandemic contribute to that uh, human behavior? You know, if you really look at the demographic changes, people say the entire era can be classified into sort of a three broad classification in terms of it's it's the social changes. You can say it, it has nothing to do with economic changes. One, we say, OK, a child neutral era, which we say very, when we have, you know, it is, if you really look at your parents, or I don't know whether the, the students here may not be aware of it, because when I look at my parents or my grandparents, etc., I know that my generation has large number of children. So when they had large number of children, some of them get educated, some of them don't get educated. So it was quite a neutral era for parents, but all of them has, some of them survived, some of them did, could not survive, some of them come out quite well, some of them could not come out well. So that was, the parents were sort of a neutral in that. But later, a French philosopher called Aries has found a very important changes in the society. The, what was the changes? The changes was that it was actually shifting from a child neutral era to call a child king era. It means that when the fertility transition happened, when the birth rate became lower, when the children became one or two in the family, the major changes was that the entire focus of the society, the entire focus of the parents has shifted to something called to children. So I think it is not at all difficult for anyone of us to understand. If you really see your parents now meet each other, two parents meet, meet each other, what would they be speaking? Definitely they will be speaking on what is your child doing? What is your son doing? What is your daughter doing? What is he educated? Education became sort of, or children, you can say, become of a center of attraction of the society. So it is called a child king era. Child is the society. You can, everyone concerned about children. But later, you would see another changes which has happened maybe from 1960s onwards in the Western countries. And it seems in many parts of the country it is spreading. The later, when the demographic transition matures, when the fertility transition becomes very, very low, you would also see something called an individualistic era, where I think the children's importance goes away from the society and the individual became very important. I live because I want to achieve this. I became much more predominant or much more important than the children. It, it really shows that, you know, even within the family, within the couples, there can be discussion. Okay, I am going for a job. Child has to be looked after. So I, you look after for two hours. After that, I will come back. Then I have to go for a party. Then at that time, because negotiation happens even within the couple or within the family, that how a children has to be taken. Because children are not as important in the child king era where the parents or the mother is ready to even abandon their job, leave their job for the sake of children. So what does it individualistic era indicate? Individualistic era also indicate that and individualism is developing in a society. My sense is that if you really look at 
let me do get in not get into the details of it but a pandemic like covid or pandemic any pandemic that way is also promoting an individualistic tendencies in a society i think kerala perhaps is an exception kerala the the policy makers the public uh, at large has been conscious enough to avoid such kind of an individualism because your connection is lost in a pandemic you have been asked not to really go to someone not to meet anyone you be always a social distancing all these things are perhaps would also be developing an individualistic tendency in a society which is is not really very positive in terms of its implications or in terms of its the behaviors of the human beings etc but many people say in the cities of this in this country many the bombay or bangalore etc these kinds of individualistic behavior are already existing but whether it will be spreading these kinds of pandemics is will be helping it to spread further we really don't know but i think there that is where actually the deliberate policies to promote the cohesiveness of the society the cohesiveness of the family is so important in an era of pandemic so i think i would just conclude here to say the few, few final words i think two or three important dimensions as i told you which if you really want to get advantage of demographic changes is either to a saving rate which is may not be feasible at this time but what is feasible is the female labor force participation enhancement and what is feasible is to make the society more inclusive rather than exclusive so these are policy changes which are possible i think this is the fallout of a demographic changes accompanied by a pandemic will also fan out span out something different in the future which we need to expect and we need to really address to appropriate policy changes so i think i will stop here at this time i look forward to uh, interacting with all of you in the coming perhaps i don't know how much time is left but i'll be happy to interact thank you so much thank you sir uh this lecture was really a fruitful one especially uh for us students which gave an insight into the current relevant issue uh and uh, you also uh, went through each aspect in a very detailed manner uh, with uh, by quoting uh, different data current data so this was uh, really a great insight uh, to the topic uh, that is pandemic in the era of demographic change implication for india so thank you so much now uh, let's get into the discussion uh this is an open forum uh all the participants you can post your questions in the chat box or the comment box of the uh youtube dear participants you can ask your questions please post in the comment box we'll have a discussion dear participants please feel free to ask questions we had a very wonderful discussion on the relevant topic
I think uh, there is no queries, so let's continue the session. Okay, we have uh, one question in the comment box of um, YouTube channel. So the question is asked by Asha Prakash. Uh, the question is, would the decrease in population, as you mentioned also, eventually lead to economic progress automatically? Sir, am I audible? Yeah, 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 yeah it's definitely you are audible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, we are not speaking about a decrease in population now. It's only a decrease in the decline in the birth rate. Um, decrease in population definitely undoubtedly is not supposed to be favorable. So I think no country or no society uh, would like their population to decline. So a human sort of a mild increase is always uh, expected to be better rather than a decline because you know <clears throat> as you know many countries some of the european countries also experienced a decline in a few decades back i think that has been a major concern so but those was a transitory period after that many of them has reached to sort of a, you can say a zero population growth or even a small increase in the population growth the question is relevant whether it is automatically lead to uh, demographic or economic advantage it appears that it doesn't lead automatically that is what uh, it has been found because I, I uh, that is what actually as I told you although many studies the studies which are based on the empirical data etc shows evidences of a direct link between demographic changes and the economic growth but most of these macro models also has its own limitations. But if you dissect it and then make it so okay, if you look at how it affects by female labor force participation, by the saving rate improvement, or whether it is by change from uh, allocation of investment from children to adults, etc. If you look at each of these characteristics, you would see that all these characteristics can change because of a change in the policies. So policies do matter. Policies are very important. I think that is undoubtedly uh, it is true that many countries were able to achieve it with appropriate policies rather than just thinking that demographic changes has an automatic advantage. But you can also put this question differently. You can also say, OK, even if you don't have policies, can demographic changes will have a some advantage? Obviously, I don't, I'm not think that demographic dividend will become demographic burden or demographic nightmare or something which as many writers have pointed out because often demographic changes has its own advantage because a smaller family is desirable than a very large families, but very small families are also not desirable. So there is something called an in-between which is always desirable. So, which will have a more positive a positive impact on the society, and then uh, having no demographic transition. So, that perhaps is my answer to the question. Thank you, sir. I hope uh, your uh, doubt is has been cleared. Now, is there any questions? Okay, we have uh, one question in the comment box. Uh, it is from uh, Ramiz Charukat. Uh, the question is, I happen to read about curse gap regarding the sharing of responsibility of taking care family or children between male and female. Whether such a change is expectable or not is his question. Yeah. Now, there are two parts to that question. One is um, what happened to the entire care system in demographic change? What happens to the gendered care system in a demographic changes? These are the two. I think this has been a larger concerns all over the world. Whether actually with the demographic changes, when children migrate, children has better expectation for their job 
uh, their prospects. So naturally, they will migrate, not leaving after leaving the parents back at home. And what would happen to the care economy? And there is no straightforward answer to that question. What? How will do we deal with it? Different societies has dealt that in different ways. Some of them institutionalized it. Some of them still, like in India, still it is a family became the important care providers. Yeah, within the care providers, definitely there is a gender differences because I don't think that we need to really uh, emphasize in a place like India. We we know the conditions of widows and all those things and what what will happen, and all those things are very well written and very well known. So naturally, there are gender differences in taking care of family and their children and between especially among males and females all these differences obviously and i think whether it is at the demographic advanced demographic transition like elder situation or it was at the younger ages between because of the sex ratio differences because that is also considered as one of the effect of demographic changes in india because why people because of the intense desire for the male children also lead to and intense desire for a smaller family accompanied by intense desire for male children will also lead to uh, adverse the sex ratio outcomes because you will also have the technology to use to take advantage of achieving the desired the sex composition of the children also within a smaller family which is also one of the you can say fallout of demographic changes in this country so there are a lot of issues which is which we can speak about as implications of demographic changes. I have not really touched upon many of those aspects. I, I know that that is what was perhaps the uh, drawback of the today's lecture, which was I concentrate only on one or two aspects. But I know that there are many aspects which is untouched, which are also very important. So I am definitely in support of Dr. Uh, that the questions that impact needs to be studied and it might to be analyzed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you, participants, uh, for actively participating uh, and uh, uh, making the session a fruitful one. So uh, let's continue. Next, uh, we have the release of Book of Abstracts. To watch the live video of uh, releasing the book abstracts, kindly pin uh, the email ID of Shinya A. And uh, to release the book of abstracts, uh, I invite our beloved HOD, Dr. Zabina Hamid P, to hand it over to Professor Dr. K. V. Ramachandran, sir. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, sir. Now we have uh, some of the family members of uh, Dr. John Matai joined with us, and we also have his grandson. So before going uh, to his talk, uh, and uh, we'll uh, watch a video uh, which shows the life of Dr. John Matai. So to watch the video of Dr. John Matai, kindly pin the email ID of uh, program convener.
It was nice and happy to watch the video um, uh, with lots of photos. Uh, and now I invite.
of rural management anand he built the institute of management to be one of the finest management schools in the world he was also director of numerous private and public sector companies national webinar in connection with the 134th birthday of dr john mathai in such a pandemic situation the topic of this event is impact of covid 19 on the transforming indian economy which is very relevant and significant in these days due to technical problems and uh, sort of time i am not going to extend my talk eminent personalities are going to deliberate on this theme elaborately in the coming days my humble humble request to my dear students is that such seminars are being conducted for you and you should make it fruitful and beneficial for your better future i thank everybody for giving me an opportunity to felicitate this function i wish the two day national webinar all success thank you thank you so much sir now it's time to wind up our first session of the national webinar Uh, for that, I would uh, invite Dr. Rajla Helen, ma'am, the Faculty of uh, Department of Economics, to deliver the vote of thanks. Good afternoon to all, respected head, Dr. Zabina, ma'am, our chief guest, Dr. C. C. Babu, controller of examination, uh, distinguished guest on and offline platform. faculty members non teaching staff research scholars and my dear students before coming to my duty first of all i would like to appreciate our beloved head dr zebina ma'am who took initiative to organize this event during the tight academic and administrative schedule and congratulate our team for their full effort and uh, support to make this program a wonderful one uh, the theme of this program Uh, it is very relevant because we know that COVID-19 is sev uh, severely affected the life of uh, people all over the world. Actually, it is decided this program is decided to inaugurate uh, by Honorable Vice Chancellor uh, due to some uh, uh, unavoidable reason. The Chancellor uh, couldn't attend this program and come into my duty that is to express vote of thanks. Uh, Today we are very pleasant and blessed with the presence of uh, Dr. C. C. Babu, controller of examination, a man with simplicity and love, who inaugurated our function and delivered a valuable and encouraging speech and wishes. So, on behalf of uh, our department and Calicut University, I express sincere thanks to uh, Dr. C. C. Babu. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank our head, Zabina, ma'am. who delivered welcome speech and presidential address uh, thank you ma'am for your energetic and best arrangements to organize such an event thank you ma'am and i would like to thank uh, professor dr k s james sir director iips mumbai who delivered a memorial lecture on topic pandemic in the era of demographic change implication for india James sir made a uh, detailed study on demographic changes in India and uh, also uh, made an informatic gives an informatic and uh, wonderful speech and made this occasion a blessed one on behalf of our department Calicut University I also express uh, thanks to James sir thank you sir next we have Sri Vivek Mathai the guest of this program the grandson of uh, Dr John Mathai. and also the consultant food diary and uh, beverages industry mumbai who made fond remembrance on dr john mathai on behalf of behalf of our department calicut university i express sincere thanks to vivek mathai sir thank you sir for your remembrance and memorable words i want to thank the respected family members of dr john mathai who received our invitation and participated in this function and made this function ha as happiest event thank you all i also thank professor dr kv ramachandran sir the convener of the program 
Professor Dr. K. X. Joseph Sir, co-convener, and also Shibu Kotarikil Sir, who delivered felicitation to this program. And I also appreciate their uh, timely coordination and uh, monitoring of all the works relating to this program. Thank you all. I am grateful to thank uh, Sneha Ma'am, Assistant Professor, Vimala College, Trishur, Day CPK, Assistant Professor, St. Joseph College, Rinyalakuda, and Anwar Sir, Assistant Professor, CCSIT, for the timely technical support. Thank you all. I thank all my colleagues, Dr. Deba Vidi, Ms. Artana, Ms. Prinsha, uh, and Mrs. Priya, for their full support and hard work to organize this event. I am very happy to express thanks to our section officer, Mansha sir, Stanley sir, and all other non-teaching staffs who took all efforts and uh, rendered full-hearted cooperation to organize this program. Thank you all. And I would like to thank the research scholar, especially Tinkle Wilson, Adira, Neeraja, and PG students who render all kinds of support this program. With all happiness in proud, I congratulate them and also thank my dear students for their hard work. <laughs> Special thanks to Vishnu Raj, Vignesh, Naushi, Anju, Kavya, Smita, Anthony, Vidya, and Vipadisha for their uh, technical support. Without their, their support, we can't realize this event a wonderful one. So with great pleasure, I appreciate them and also thank them. Thank you all. I also express thanks to all committee members who laid their complete efforts for the success of the program. Thank you all. On behalf of our department, I would like to thank the media person who made this function a colorful one. And finally, uh, on behalf of our department and uh, energetic team, I express heartfelt thanks to all distinguished guests from different departments and institutions and made this event a grand, colorful and wonderful one. So stay online, listen to the program, enjoy our program and also comment, make comments on our program. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. Uh, there is an announcement. Uh, now we will break for the lunch. Uh, our second session of day one will commence at sharp 2 p.m. So all the participants are kindly requested to join the afternoon session by 1.45 p.m. Uh, the afternoon session will be uh, chaired by Professor Dr. U.S. Mishra from CDS Trivandrum. Uh, on the topic, some revelation of insecurities and vulnerabilities. So all are requested to join the same link by 1.45 p.m. Thank you. Baba, sir, thank you so much for being with us. Jane, sir, 